Well, greetings, everyone. David Arendelle here, and I get a chance to talk to you about a draft document that nearly 100 people have been working on for the past year and a half on being able to provide some recommendations on how to be most effective when offering course-based learning assistance. Course-based learning assistance is a generic term that's talking about peer-assisted learning groups. It could be applicable to Emerging Scholars Program. That's one that Dr. Treisman developed. Peer-led team learning, supplemental instruction, and much, much more. These documents that you can download, in fact, I've provided the web link here on the very first page, umn.edu, excuse me, z.umn.edu slash peer guides. Well, this is a document that's nearly 85 pages long, providing specific recommendations on how you can enhance and add more to your peer learning program. And I'm going to share just a little bit of the highlights here and then remind you once again of the place to be able to download this document. And also, it's in Word format so that you could actually go ahead, mark it up, and use track changes from Word and be able to send it back to me then. One other website I wanted to bring to your attention, and that one's this one, z.umn.edu slash peer learning. That's my primary website where I disseminate a lot of scholarship developed by me, but mostly by other people, including some of our peer study group leaders. So you'll end up seeing handouts and annotated bibliography of 1,950 other publications about peer learning programs that are used around the world, and you see the rest of them there as well. So just kind of think of this as a great place to come for professional development, and that's really part of what the CLA guidelines are about. They're called guidelines. They're not called requirements. They're just simply to express that these are things that hundreds of other people who manage and run their own peer learning groups have said, well, those are really helpful practices that could probably help most any other program to be more effective in what you're doing with your students then. As I said, the program uh, that these are applicable to, well, in particular, we've really looked at the six major ones that are used nationally and internationally. So it is not specific about any one of these. These guidelines are not meant to replace the specific training protocols and training materials that are issued by the organizations that created these other learning models. So please understand that. Think of this as these other organizations, they've already set the foundation. And they're the ones that really set the requirements. Think of the CLA guidelines as setting up on top as perhaps things that could help to improve or to be add-ons or to aspire to. You know, one of the challenges is there's never enough time, money, and people to be able to do everything to the level of quality that we want. So I want you to think about this CLA set of guidelines as simply a menu, or think of it as a grocery store uh, in terms of lots of items are on the shelf. There's nothing that says that one is a better item than the other one, but from a collective point of view, these guidelines have been used at this point by people from about 650 plus different institutions from around the world, and they have found them to be useful, and I hope you take a look at them. This really builds upon the second edition of this particular document that came out about a decade ago. And it was about best practices in academic support programs. And CLA was one of those. As you can see here inside of this document, it's one of the four. There were also more generic um, practices for the teaching learning process, developmental level courses, and also for tutoring. We're in the process of coming out with the third edition of this sometime in the next year or so. 
But the thing that you get to do is that you get to have a sneak peek at what the CLA guidelines look like. What's the purpose of the guidelines? Well, as I just said before, it's to provide guidance and practices that might increase, could is the important word here, to help increase efficiency. This one's a really key one. It's not about judging. Whenever you look at these guides, and they go on for, what, about 85 plus pages or so, I remember some of the review team that worked on this sending me back some emails saying, David, I work at a campus to where I have a multiple set of programs in addition to peer learning that I'm in charge of. Are you trying to tell me that if I'm not doing everything that's inside of this guidebook, there's something wrong with me? And I said, heaven's sake, I apologize to him. And I said, that was never the intent. And that's the reason why I make a real point of talking to people that they understand very clearly. And you'll see that if you look at the introduction to the guides. It's very, very clear. In fact, I think it's in paragraph number one that these guides are not about judgment. It's not about if you're not doing something, there's something missing and you're denying some sort of benefit to your students. Not at all. This is a collective wisdom. This is a collection of things that other people have found helpful. But as I said, if we all had enough time, people, and resources, and budget, we'd be able to do everything. Well, that's not very realistic. But putting together a guide like this can be useful as a tool when you're working with your administrators and you're able to share with them well, this is a document which has been reviewed, as I said, 650 different institutions, a review team that reviewed every single word inside of here. There was 50 of them. And uh, let me tell you, it took a long, long time to edit and to incorporate all of their wonderful wisdom that they provided to me. It's a document that you can use to help argue for you to get more time, resources, people, and staff then. It may be useful for faculty members because you can take a number of practices which are helpful for peer learning programs, which are study groups that are run oftentimes by student paraprofessionals at the undergraduate or maybe at the graduate level. Well, they can incorporate these inside of their own pedagogy for how they're teaching their own class. I just finished up after 40 years as a first-year global history teacher along with other duties that I've been responsible for. I found ways to try to be able to bring these practices into the classroom in the different ways in which I worked with students, and I found this to be a wonderful way to help enrich the learning environment. Once again, it's not expected that every single practice is going to be used here. Some don't apply at all. doesn't make any sense. And as I've said, what, this now makes the third time, budget, personnel, and time is not equal for all of us. I know this. I've served as an administrator, faculty member at the same time as helping to manage programs. One of the things that I did at one of my institutions was every time I would ask a staff member to take on a new duty, we would get out their job description and figure out, can we fit this in in a reasonable way, or is there certain things that we have to stop doing? And we would sometimes do that, because it's not fair to keep asking people to keep doing more and more and more. That just simply leads to burnout for people, people who end up changing jobs because it's just unlivable, and then that makes it even worse for the program because now we have to start all over again. And it's also not a very humane thing to do to anybody. So uh, hopefully I've set that up well enough. Inside, we've broken it into 12 different sections, and I won't read through all of the different 12 here, but we've separated these things out into these different areas. You happen to be very familiar with the Council for the Advancement of Standards, cas.edu. It's an organization that is focused on standards development, and they've come up with 30-plus sets of standards for how we can improve student affairs, everything from orientation programs, academic advisement, to learning assistance, plus 27 more. 
this is the 12 template things that any set of practices ought to have. And it's been really pretty exciting, i got to tell you. Uh, it's also a good thing that I uh, retired from work, so I had enough time to kind of work on all of this. It's a pretty monstrous project. I find it very enriching and exciting. And I always enjoy seeing these guides through the eyes of other users as well as the other reviewers to help make it better. There's two kinds of statements that are inside of here. Things which we think are essential that many, not all, but many peer supervisors find important. And then we have recommendations. And that's the reason why I talked about this word before. Hopefully I spell it mostly correct. They're aspirational. They're things that we'd like to be able to do whenever we get the time, the resources, and the materials, the people. Also maybe in terms of it's something that we do a few years from now. It gives us goals to work towards. It's things that we can put into our strategic plan whenever the administrator to whom we're responsible is saying, well, what are you going to be doing different with the program next year? Where do you see yourself five years from now? Well, this can be helpful to you to help identify what do lots of other people who run learning programs similar to you, well, what are they saying are important? So some things you may never do or you may never be able to get to that point. But then again, we all have aspirations and we all have goals. So I just want you to think about it in that way. I've talked about this word a number of times, haven't I? It's the issue of time. I think that it's the most important ingredient in program improvement. You know, you can throw money at stuff, but if you don't have the time to put it the quality in that you want, then it's really hard to bring the quality up. You've got to have the time in order to be able to make the decisions, to do the coaching sessions with the staff, to be careful about the development of professional development materials. If we don't have that, we can have all the money we want, but if we don't have time to be wise in how we're spending the money, then it's really kind of a waste. So it's something that I've learned a lot. I've been running learning centers and um, peer-assisted learning programs and other academic intervention programs. I've been in higher ed 40 years, and I'd say probably 35 of my 40 years were running learning centers along with teaching my classes, uh, tutoring centers, testing centers, I was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City for what, 13 years or so and helping to do national dissemination of supplemental instruction and, and had a chance to go abroad and see how SI was operating in other countries. Boy, that's really exciting. In fact, I think my best experience was one time going to another country to a SI conference that was totally run by the student leaders. It was really quite fascinating. The energy that they brought to the meetings were just incredible. Well, once again, just want to make a comment uh, about, in case you want to learn more about the professional literature of the peer-assisted learning programs, here's all the different kinds of models. There's common characteristics. They have a clear um, set of standards by which they're evaluated, a clear set of procedures in which they operate. Uh, they've been replicated at multiple institutions, many of which have been um, replicated in multiple parts of the world. And I just simply would say, in case you'd like to read more about the literature, there is like 1,550 plus publications and research studies if you end up going to there. I have a separate video that looks at what goes into this peer um, um, uh, bibliography. But let me just simply just kind of tease that out for you. And also we have a podcast at palgroups.org. And I think one of the most exciting things, they have me in there talking. So whatever. I think the real exciting podcast episodes or the interviews with the student leaders of the peer learning groups. 
And it's wonderful to hear the refreshing voice of a young person through their eyes explaining what's going on inside the sessions and what they're gaining as a result of this. It's really quite a transformative process. But you already know that. If you're running programs, you're having conversations with your student leaders, and you hear those stories. And sometimes it's those stories that help keep going whenever we're working late at night and trying to deal with impossible deadlines. Finally, uh, there's lots of other uh, websites and all kinds of other additional material about peer-assisted learning which is somewhat similar to um, course-based learning assistance, we just simply chose to use that particular term, CLA, uh, in order to differentiate. Well, these are a set of principles and guides uh, for people to consider that are essential or are recommended. So you can see the different uh, websites. I encourage you to contact me. That's my cell phone number. Pick it up and give me a call. I'd much rather talk to you than the 10 robocalls. I swear to goodness, some days it's 10 from people who want to give me credit cards, who want to sell me new Medicare GAP supplemental programs or giving to some weird charity. I think your conversation would be so much better. Also, there's my email address as well. So I hope you take a look at these CLA guides. I hope that you decide to maybe even mark up some of them and send them back because I carefully look at all of the revisions that people recommend, both things to add, things to improve, and things to delete. And I hope that you might find it useful to you. Well, thanks for listening today. I hope my words were useful in your work in helping young people to achieve their dreams. Take good care, everybody. Thanks for listening.